Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending March 8th. First up, this article was sent by Kara Betazoid, a friend of mine on Facebook. This is a 3D printed an electronic glove that could help keep your heart beating forever. Uh, this is kind of cool. Now, they, they do have slip-on socks for hearts that do this same kind of thing with sensors also and uh, but the problem is getting it to fit just exactly right so um, what they're doing is using 3d printing and stretchable electronics that have just been developed and this is from uh, the researchers from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign not too far to the south from me and Washington University in St. Louis so uh, part of the Midwest universities and uh, I'll put a picture up here and what it does is it has various sensors all over the heart so if it's sensing some kind of a heart attack or um, an arrhythmia in your heart it can actually give minor shocks to the selected areas instead of before where they would just implant some type of a pacemaker or some type of a, a device that gives your heart a shock and just hope that it doesn't do too much to damage your heart or something like that this is a, a lot more selective and it's since it's going to be hand fitted to each individual person's heart because of your heart, the movement and the beating and stuff like that, it's really hard to get things to fit just exactly right. But um, 3D printing and the stretchable electronics seems to be going to uh, bring this thing to pass. This article that um, I'm reading from right now, and I'll give you the link down below, is from independent.ie. It's an Irish website, and then there's another link if you're a member of the Facebook page for the Dumpster Divers. There's another link to another similar article, but I like this one by The Independent just a little bit better. And then down below there's a video besides. What I'm liking more and more is a lot more of these articles do include videos, including the next one here. This was sent to, uh, sent to me by my friend 1954 Shadow, and this is kind of an old throwback. This is Project Orion. Maybe some of you are aware of it, but back up. A long time ago when they were just getting past using nuclear weapons for uh, warfare in World War II, a lot of scientists got together, especially Freeman Dyson, and were working on nuclear power to do things other than weapons and stuff like that. So what they did was they got together on a project of actually using nuclear bombs to propel spacecraft. And at first it seemed like a ridiculous idea, but when they did the engineering on it, there, it was actually possible to develop quite large spaceships that would be propelled by nuclear explosions. They would use some type of a shock absorber device. It would still probably not be a real comfortable ride because as these bombs would be dropped out, they would drift about 60 or they would actually be 60 meters trailing behind the craft when they would explode and they would hit the shock plate. So it would not be a comfortable ride, but you could actually get some pretty huge spaceships, the kind of starships with uh, large crews and stuff like that. Um, and the engineering was solid. If you look at this too down below, there's a, a video of this too. This was pretty much put together by Freeman Dyson's son George. And there's a really good interview with Arthur C. Clarke also about this. He was actually going to use it in 2001 Space Odyssey as the propulsion method for one of the ships. But then <clears throat> at the last minute, you'll see, you'll see I, I don't want to give the whole thing away, but you'll see in the documentary a little bit more about it. Um, the one thing that finally killed it really was the... Uh, um, nuclear arms treaty that we had signed with Russia and uh, where nobody was going to actually do nuclear explosions anymore in the air they were actually going to all be uh, underground explosions and, and tests and stuff like that so that kind of killed it at the last but the one thing that they couldn't overcome and there was no way they could figure out with engineering to be able to do it <clears throat> is the fact that when you do explode air bombs on the earth for propelling the craft to get it up into orbit there's just no way you can get away from the the radiation and the nuclear fallout i would say it would be a lot more practical for probably using chemical rockets to get the spacecraft up into outer space and then as soon as it was away from the earth maybe then using the uh, bombs to propel it some somewhat like that but anyway it's uh just an interesting idea and just the fact that it even could practically work as an engineering solution kind of fascinated me because you would just think it would be pretty much impossible but it really wasn't so uh, yeah if you get a chance to check that out um, also a little article <coughs> excuse me little article after that from Gizmodo by 1954 shadow also yeah, a little article about the room where the internet was born it was kind of cool that the it talks about the two original universities that were hooked together and the very first message sent over the internet crashed it was just the letters LO because the message could not even be sent so I'll put that link below too and they uh, somebody helped recreate they still have the original machine and somebody helped recreate the room back in the 1960s style but um, 
Yeah, the very first two computers hooked together that created the internet and the very first message that was sent. Um, less than totally successful, but at least was so. Uh, this next one, I'm not sure who sent me the original link on this because I had a computer crash. I, I lost some of the information on my TDD file, but if you were the one that sent this about a week ago, let me know. Um, I also see that um, someone posted, Ms. Nighthawk, she posted on the uh, Dumpster Divers Facebook page the same thing. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is actually going to be starting as of tonight. This is Sunday when I'm broadcasting this right now. Um, as of tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern. 8 p.m. Central, they are resurrecting. It's not going to be the exact same show, but they're bringing back Cosmos. Um, they're going to make it kind of after a flavor of the original Cosmos show, but it's not going to be a reboot. It's going to be a, a new type of show, but it's going to have some of the same old style as the old Cosmos show. And it's interesting because Carl Sagan actually was the mentor to Neil deGrasse Tyson, and the show, this reboot of the show, or whatever you want to call it, um, this redo of the show was... Uh, put together by his widow Andrea. So that is kind of cool. If you get a chance to check it out, it's going to be on Fox, and then it's going to be after Sunday night when they broadcast the original episode, it's going to be rebroadcast on uh, the different National Geographic channels. One thing I thought was really strange, and a lot of people were asking, I went to the site um, that's promoting it, the Fox site that's promoting it, and people were just asking time after time in the comments with no answers, why aren't you making it easy to find this streaming? I don't know if it even exists, but um, I see no evidence that it does. Why don't you make this streaming, even with all the full commercials in it, um, make it easy for us to find? As geeks, we know where we can, after it's broadcast, we know the sites we can go to and end up finding a copy, so watching it's not going to be a big deal, especially right after it's broadcast, but um, why not make a legitimate streaming channel? I mean, come on, this is, you know, this is the year 2014. We should be able to handle this pretty easy, especially if people are willing to watch the commercials. What's the big difference? So, Anyway, if you get a chance, check out the new version of Cosmos. It will be just like the original. I think it's going to be a limited series, 13 episodes. At least that's the last I heard about it. This next one's from Navy Thomas 8. This is from BBC.com. Um, this is a new magnetic material, and the neat thing about it, it's a two-layered magnetic material and uh, let me get it up here um, one of the material, well let me read the first part, the metal bilayer needs only a small shift in temperature to dramatically alter its magnetism, a tremendously useful property in electronic engineering they actually um, already can do that but the problem is it takes a lot of energy and it takes a laser beam to do that um, one of the, temp one of the um, magnetic elements is nickel and let me see if I can find what the other well, uh, no, nah, I can't. Oh well. Rather than have you guys wait and everything like that, I'll, the the main thing with to me is it's it's a step. Only having a, a twenty degree temperature fluctuation to to control the magnetic field and the strength of the magnetic field, it's like going from tubes to transistors. If you know the principles of it, back when we had tube powered radios and stuff like that, it was used as a valve to control the flow of electrons. But it required a lot of energy. It produced a lot of heat. They didn't last very long. You were constantly having to replace these things because they were like light bulbs. They had elements and they would burn out. But then when we switched to transistors they were solid state so they didn't have parts that would burn out um, very small voltage fluctuations in the source could uh, control big uh, could, could control other larger voltages or you could even use it as a switch to turn on and off just like you could use a tube so um, just being able to do this with way less power usage and everything they're talking about maybe that it could uh, be used for hard drives in the future and stuff like that wish I could find these two chemicals that they're talking about. One of them is nickel, but uh, anyway, this is new magnetic material could boost electronics. So if you get a chance, check that out. And I wanted to talk a little bit about, I did see the movie Gravity with George Clooney and Sandra Bullock. Um, I'd give it four and a half out of five stars. There were, there were a few science uh, blunders in there. I think uh, the one that most people talk about, I agree with, that's uh, where they, I don't want to try to, give any spoilers here so I'll try to put this in a way that doesn't really spoil it at all but they um, catch up to the space station and they're tethered together and George Clooney is uh, yelling at Sandra Bullock like he's trying like um, if she doesn't um, cut him loose that or he, or he doesn't cut loose that he will pull her away from the space station and it's like once you're caught up and you've matched speed unless you have some kind of a circular momentum or something like that and that's the thing about it too that they could have made this more believable if uh, 
when they would have caught up to the station, they could have had where Senator Bullock like grabbed the part on the station and then he um, trailing behind her would all of a sudden start a centrifugal type of motion and then he would actually be pulling and being that there was no air to break him, his momentum or anything like that, he would actually be circling around and the centripetal motion would actually cause him to pull and then they could have just by changing that a little bit made it totally logical and totally scientific but for whatever reason they didn't. Um, didn't spoil the movie at all, it was a bit annoying. Actually the most annoying part was um, before they reached the International Space Station when they went back to the shuttle and uh, it was damaged somewhat but she was talking about that her oxygen supply was below 10 percent and I'm like well, wait a minute, you've just gone back to the shuttle. It's pretty much still in one large piece, so why don't you go in there and grab an oxygen canister or switch out whatever in your spacesuit? Now, it could have been, I'm not an expert on spacesuits in the space shuttle, so it could have been something that was not really possible to do under those conditions, but um, I don't know, it just seemed to me to be a logical thing, too, instead of uh, going back to the space shuttle, checking some things out, and then heading towards the International Space Station with low oxygen. I mean, why not, you know, try to refresh your oxygen first before you make that trip? Um, the other thing about it that people mention, too, is if you do know um, the different orbits of the different craft, they had uh, three different, the space shuttle, they had the International Space Station, and the Chinese Space Station, and uh, you can't really, there is no way that you can practically travel between the three of them, um, at least the way they were traveling. It takes quite a bit of energy and they're not in the same types of orbits and they're not close enough together to make it practical, but nonetheless for the movie, uh, the drama and the story of the movie works really well enough. I I don't think really, unless you just really hate outer space movies, I don't think you'll dislike the, the film at all. And I'm not, I'm saying that, saying that I'm not even really a particular fan of George Clooney. I don't care for him too much myself, but he did a good enough job that, you know, nobody did anything really to, to ruin the movie enough is the best way I could put it to uh, make it bad. So yeah, give it, I'd give it four and a half stars. If you get a chance, be sure and check out the Facebook page, the Dumpster Divers. We're still gaining members every week. It seems like three or four more people join. So um, a great place if you can, uh, if you're on to Facebook. And uh, next week, I want to get into uh, uh, Jose Calars. I mean, well, he's Jose Versus now. I think he had a Versus motorcycle. But uh, I want to start, start talking more and more about bicycles, too, with the weather getting warmer. I don't want to uh, limit my talking about two wheels to only motorcycles just because I happen to ride motorcycles. I also like bicycles. I know a lot of my friends do. And it's another two-wheel type of transportation. And I've got a cool gadget to share with you next week. Um, and then anything else anybody wants to share, I'm going to keep on a lookout, too. I would like to to talk a little bit more about two-wheeled pedal transportation. So anyway, that's it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.